the mirror one of the simplest things that we teach simply repeating the last one to three words of what someone has said with either an upward inflection or a downward inflection and which inflection you use is very precise for the moment right if you want them to continue if you want it to sound like a question please go on i'd love for you to tell me more about that that's where the upward inflection comes into play if you're mirroring and you simply want to indicate i'm with you i'm following you we are in tow with one another in the information that you're trying to convey to me that's when you use a downward inflection I, um, I think we can get right into giving people tips and, you know, insights around negotiating all different parts of things around their life. And I think it's something that people struggle with, you know, partly because it's this art and science that a lot of us haven't really been taught growing up. We've just been kind of um, taught most of us through the academic formats and there's no curriculum around negotiation that happens in high school or uh, parts of university, but a lot of them are outdated as well. And, you know, I think someone that is uh, gaining experience in, in, in the business world and every parts of life, that's kind of the beauty about negotiation is that it can apply to life and business as well. Um, but yeah, talk to me a little bit about why, why it's been so difficult for someone to learn about negotiation and become a good negotiator. Well, I think a lot of it starts with exactly your point. Like it, it is a shame that negotiation is not a required part of the curriculum, especially in higher learning. Like it is, it's just amazing. And to your point, even in colleges and, and universities that do offer negotiation, it's an elective. Like you, you can be some, any form of, of, of a business major does not automatically include a negotiation course. Like that is, that's amazing to me. And so exactly to your point, I think that's where it starts. And we learn by what we see, what's around us. Unfortunately, a lot of what we see in regards to negotiation is on TV and movies and, you know, different things that, we, you know, on the internet, like those are the things we get exposed to. And then unfortunately, right. And some people are going to be insulted by this you get exposed to bad habits in the workplace, you know, cause you're watching someone that's higher up than you on the food chain negotiate and they were never officially taught how to negotiate either. And so they got bad habits that then, and so then it just spreads, right? Ripple effect. So um, what I find really interesting about it, especially in regards to just human nature and our kind of natural reaction to negotiation very much on a subconscious level and for a lot of people it is on a conscious level being emotionally connected to solving the problem or the emotional connection to um how we get from a to b we know that that plays a huge role and we then equate to like, how do, how do we get to that point? We equate it to, well, if I can explain it to them really well, then they'll feel as good about the solution as I do. If I can make them understand it as deeply as I understand it. And so I'll sit down and I'll just, I'll explain it to them until I'm blue in the face. And that'll give them the emotions they need to be tied and have, have buy into the solution. And then everything will be fine. And as, as we all know, that that's not necessarily how that works. <laughs> yeah, and I, I totally agree. I mean, what just based on that point that you scenario that you mentioned, you know, wh where is the pitfall here? Where is the big mistake when someone starts, you know, that process of negotiating? What is the biggest pitfall someone makes that you've seen commonly happen? Biggest pitfall that people make commonly in negotiation it's really kind of two points but the biggest one is just trying to get people to say yes you know we're, we're all uh uh yes addicted to a certain degree right we want approval we want confirmation we want commitment from the other side 
that comes most easily in the form of Y E S. And so how do we get them to yes quicker and then we'll be in a good spot. And I, I think that's probably the biggest one. And when we go in seeking the approval of the other side that directly affects our emotional construct. We are now someone that's at the table looking for approval as opposed to someone at the table that is supposed to be seen as a trusted advisor or potential partner collaborator. And it's much easier to do a deal with someone you trust as an advisor than it is for someone that's just looking for approval from you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, one of the things that I've learned and have always tried to think more carefully about is kind of this process of like pre-negotiation of things that you do before you even get into the table. Maybe these are certain expectations you set or the way you've communicated with them before you actually go into that conversation. Well, what have you learned about the pre, you know, strategies that you that that have worked for you uh before you even get into the table yeah no that's that's great so here there, there's i'll start with two things to eliminate and then two things to two habits to start dropping in right to what you're already doing so first thing um doing extensive research where you you're spending hours on the internet reading websites and reading biographies and going on LinkedIn and doing all that extra due diligence, checking their profiles, all those things. Um, you can drive yourself crazy trying to gather as much as you can from all of that and actually not find much that's that useful. You know, knowing what their high school mascot was is not going to convince them to give you $20 million. And so the pertinent information that you need to know, because information is power, right? We all know that, is to be gathered at the table with the individual. And so don't drive yourself nuts doing a bunch of extra internet research, number one. And then number two, right, this, this, this mental prep, right? The, the pre-negotiation uh, uh, lead up, as it were, the mental prep that we do, a lot of us, fall into what Dan Sullivan would refer to as, as gap thinking, as opposed to gain thinking, right? It's an abundance mindset versus fixed mindset. And so uh, a lot of us fall into this trap where we start to compromise our own position before we even get in the room with this mental lead up that we do. And so things like, oh, we can never ask them that because this is what they're gonna say, or we, we, we can't approach this issue with them because it's too volatile, or we can never expose this piece of information to them because it hurts our leverage. You're automatically compromising your own position before you've gotten to the table. And so mental reps are important before you get in the room, but getting out of the habit of, we can't ask them that, and turning that into what's the best way to approach this problem, right? Automatically shutting off avenues of communication because you're convinced about how they're gonna respond is you shooting yourself in the foot. And so two things that I, that I would definitely add to it. Number one, get an accountability buddy, get a sounding board partner, whatever term you like to use, right? Everybody's got different terms, but a partner that you trust that can be a legitimate sounding board for you. This person can help you at least think through your communication out loud and all human beings process the information a little bit differently when it comes out of our mouth and back into our ears. We actually process it slightly differently than we do in complete silence and we, when we keep it all in our brain. So having a good sounding board partner. And then, right, again, lead up prep is good. How you structure your goals is a big part of it. A lot of us like to structure our goals around the end result. We're going to get in today and we're going to sell them the demo. Right, we're going to get in today, and we're going to we're going to get the ten million dollar deal. We're going to convince them to sign on for another five years. We're going to get their investment, right? And you're deciding on the end result, and completely ignoring all the goals along the way. And so, get rid of the end result goals. And the reason for that is, you limit yourself when you put goals like that on. You will never make an eleven million dollar deal if your goal was ten. So, do not put a ceiling on yourself. Your goal should be more focused around 
what are the thought shaping questions that we're going to use to direct our mindset on this? What's the proof of life uh, approach that we're going to use to get them to defend us so that they can tell us how wonderful we are and prove that we're the favorite in the deal? And then lastly, how do we start by setting expectations with an accusations audit or an opening summary? These are the goals that we have. How do we get them to tell us things that they wouldn't tell anybody else? That's goal number one. Hmm. And how do we do that? How do we get them to open up in ways that they wouldn't with other people? That's kind of the, the million dollar question, right? And I, was, I was hoping you're going to ask me that, Sean. Yeah, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's exactly it, right? How do we build enough rapport that they would reveal very sensitive things to us, right? What we refer to as black swans, hence the name of the organization. And the, the first thing is, I think Stephen Covey is one of the people that said it best. Seek first to understand before being understood. And so how that translates from a negotiation context is all of your data justifications and, and positions that you feel like you need to express to the other side when you get to the table, let all of that go. For all intents and purposes, put it in a box that says do not open unless, right, dot, dot, dot. Like literally put all that stuff aside and your initial approach has to be completely focused on that. When I come in the room about 10, 15 minutes in, I'm going to be able to completely articulate what their mindset is, how they got there, and how they think it affects their future. That's going to be my initial goal, right? And getting, getting those things verbalized from me to them, right? Articulating their world for them. That's a big piece of how we do that. Now, it sounds like a long way around, right? That sounds like the long road to the typical negotiator. Like, well, aren't I wasting time if I'm not laying out what my objectives are? If I'm not solidifying my position, right? It feels like I'm wasting time. And going back to what I mentioned earlier, we know that the subconscious nature around influence our emotional ties. How do I get your buy-in? How do I get you emotionally involved? People do not, or, or, or let me rephrase that. People get more quickly emotionally involved in ideas or solutions when they feel like it's catered to them specifically, right? Again, another piece that we all know. Now, how do we get that is the tactical empathy piece of explaining them to themselves. Like, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna explain you to you. That's probably, this, the, I guess, the simplest way I could put it. I'm gonna explain you to yourself. That's the only way that we can make them feel like we actually understand. No one feels understood with the words, I understand, or I get it. That is a cheap currency. We actually have to articulate what that understanding is. And that's how people open up, right? When they feel understood, like I can trust you. You, you, you have verbalized things about me in a way that no one else has. So guess what? I'm going to tell you things that I've never told anyone else before. And that's how that reciprocity pendulum swings, as it were. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense. We're dealing with humans, these, these social creatures, that we are at the end of the day and we have emotional needs and we have these barriers that naturally occur. A lot of negotiations happen without knowing the other person, without having spent time or building that trust, or, you know, we, we don't really know the type of person that is on the other side. And we also have prejudgments, right? We always have these preconceptions of like what we think this person might be, based on previous experiences we've had with similar people. And, you know, we always have these things that are built up in our heads and it's really difficult to, to build that trust. So one of the things you're suggesting is be vulnerable, listen first, and I'll essentially paraphrase kind of the things that the other person on the other side are looking for to help them better understand. Um, what are some other ways to build that trust immediately, knowing that you don't have a lot of time? Yeah, no, that's, 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 a, that's a really good point. So you mentioned paraphrasing someone's position. 
technically speaking, paraphrase is actually one of the skills on what Black Swan would refer to as the N9 list. And that would be one of the things we'd want to utilize. Also on that list, uh, we'll recall the quick two plus one labels, mirrors, dynamic silence, along with paraphrase, you know, and calibrated questions. Those are really the skills that we would advocate leaning on heavily early on in the negotiation process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just want to back up something you said earlier about, you know, how judgmental we are, you know, human beings, we're, we're judgmental creatures because we're so emotionally driven. And, and the reason I just wanted to highlight that is that goes back to one of the reasons why you can drive yourself nuts with internet research before a negotiation because you start to check off the info in your mind and you start to make judgments before you've even had a chance to speak to this person because of what you read on the internet. Yeah. And that is an emotional distraction for us when we're actually operating in the moment. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, but going back to specific skills, the mirror, one of the simplest things that we teach, simply repeating the last one to three words of what someone has said with either an upward inflection or a downward inflection. And which inflection you use is very precise for the moment, right? If you want them to continue, if you want it to sound like a question, please go on. I'd love for you to tell me more about that. That's where the upward inflection comes into play. If you're mirroring and you simply want to indicate, I'm with you, I'm following you, we are in tow with one another and the information that you're trying to convey to me, that's when you use a downward inflection, right? Context, situations are going to drive the strategy, especially in regards to that skill. And then another one we lean on heavily, the, the labels, which are just verbal observations that start with the scenes, it sounds, it looks, or it feels. And then pointedly with this skill, you're actually trying to label the issue behind what someone has said. And so, for example, someone says, I can't pay that. That's not in our budget. That costs too much, right? Well, we all, we've all run into that phrase at some point in our lives. What's driving that messaging is pressure that that person or that group of people are getting internally from the higher ups or even laterally within their own organization. And so how you label something like, oh, I can't pay that, that too, that's too much money would be something like, it sounds like you're under a lot of pressure. It seems like you've already had some tough conversations about the budget with people higher up in the organization. What they're indicating to you is I am, I have to answer to other people and this is what they're going to tell me. So how do I convince them? Hmm. And so with the label, you need to identify what's going on behind the scenes. Sounds like you're going to have a tough conversation coming out of this meeting on, uh, based on that, on that number. Well, yeah, and here's some information that I haven't told you yet, right? It's interesting how that immediately follows on the heels of being able to, to identify an emotional position. Yeah. And it seems like you're shifting instead of trying to be on the opposite side of the table, you're getting yourself on the same side and saying, Hey, how do we work together to pitch this to their boss or the, their partner to make this work for both people? And I like that shift that you made. Yeah, that's, that's very well said, Sean. One of the other kind of baselines behind tactile empathy is remember that the adversary is not the counterpart. The people on the other side of the table are not your adversary. The adversary is actually the problem. The people on the other side of the table are teammates. And it's your job to come together in collaboration to solve the problem as a team. And so that's exactly why we approach it that way. It seems like you're dealing with this. seems like this is a real problem for you. That's how we start to articulate how they see the world. Yeah. In, in some sense, you're kind of playing this like therapist role of like listening to their problems, reiterating it, making them feel understood, heard. You know, it's this kind of taking that step back approach that you have to do to really start that conversation and build that trust initially. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. The, the term that we use internally here at Black Swan is we put them on the couch. That's mm -hmm. what we actually, that's what, but, but it's very much like that. It is a situation where you are hearing them out. Yeah. They have emotional hangups. There are negative things standing in the way of their ability to make a decision. Unless we help them remove those negative barriers, they're not going to have any reason to get them out of the way. 
Mm. So you're asking questions and you're getting to the root of what the issue could be from getting them to say yes or move on to the next step. I mean, at, at what point do you start to lead the conversation you know, after they feel, you know, understood, let's say that you feel that there's some trust being built. What is kind of that next step that someone should take to try to get to that desired goal where, you know, ideally both sides win, uh, but do you try to lead that conversation somewhere and kind of what are the strategies that you found to be useful for that next step after the trust has been built? Yeah, no, great question. And so I want to back up just a little bit one of the things I didn't make clear earlier, and I did reference this, I just didn't make it clear. We actually never try to get people to say yes. Now there is a difference between getting someone to agree and getting someone to say yes, but they don't necessarily always go together. And you can get agreement without having to drive somebody to a yes. So that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the first thing. And so, um, you know, focusing in, how do you, how do you take control? How do you take the lead? What's really interesting is when you get completely fluent in tactical empathy, which, you know, it's a journey, right? It's not something that happens overnight, but you get into what we call re, right? We have shu ha and re, which are our levels of expertise, a Japanese martial arts concept that just lays out the path to mastery. So when you get into re, which is mastery level, you never explain and you never lead. Because when you have completely addressed and diffused all the negatives and then tied everything that they already have that's positive to what we're trying to do, they'll make the deal for you. Now that sounds nuts. The first time I explained this to who is now my uh, director of biz dad here at, at Black Swan by the name of Dave Johnson, who's absolutely fantastic. And I said, they will make the deal for you as long as you execute tactical empathy well. And she said, you're out of your mind. Four months later, we had a conversation and she says, you know, when you execute tactical, tactical empathy well, they just make the deal for you. You don't actually have to ask for anything because we all understand why we're here, right? You're an investor. I'm a guy who's got a small business and I need your investment. I don't need to ask for the investment. That's why you're in the room. You just need the emotional construct that's going to allow you to go, hey, I think I'll give you my money. And so my job isn't about making the ask. My job is how do I emotionally tie you in a positive way and give you buy-in to wanting to invest in me? And so, um, you know, when we, when, when, when we take that approach, people want to deal with you. Now, strictly speaking, we never want to get into what our goals and objectives are until we've crossed what Black Swan refers to as the that's right bridge. So for any of our listeners, if you read the book, Never Split the Difference, you're probably familiar with what we call, what are the words in negotiation better than yes? It's that's right. And so until you've achieved the that's right moment, you cannot get into any of that stuff because they have not indicated they're ready to listen. That's right, is an indicator of many things. One of them is, now I'm ready to hear what you have to say. And until you get that's right, they've never expressed that I'm willing to hear what you have to say. And so how do we get that permission from them? We got to get to that's right. Usually comes from the skill we call summary. So far, you've told me, as a result, you feel, and then dead silence. And you sit and you wait for that that's right as long as it takes. Hmm. And sometimes that, I'm assuming, may not happen within that first meeting, right? You're trying to establish as long as it takes to get there. That's exactly right. The other thing that, that, that we, we tend to not factor into our pre-negotiation prep is the fact that today might be the first of a series of conversations. A lot of times we go and hope, like, today's the day, right? We're going to make yeah. the decision today. And then four hours later, there is no decision. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to meet in the next three months. And it's a huge letdown to everyone because we weren't mentally prepared for the moment. Because we didn't mentally prepare ourselves before we walked in. We went, here's our goal. We're going to get $10 million today in this meeting in four hours. And when it doesn't happen, then it's like, well, what do we do now? And so that's exactly right. Understanding that it's probably going to be a series of negotiations, especially based on who the type of negotiator is on the other side. And then, yeah, as, as, as be willing to embrace the awkwardness 
of silence and creating tremendous amounts of space without actual words during the course of the interaction. Right. Yeah. I mean, and people can smell that, right? You, you don't want to be that desperate guy on a first date that has this goal of kissing a girl on the first date and knowing that that's, you know, you're not really aware of the signals that she's giving because you just have this fixed goal uh, and people can sense that desperation, especially on the other side, when all they're trying to think about is how, why they should say no, right? Investors are always trying to find the, the one reason why they shouldn't give you the money or why they shouldn't give you the sale. And yeah, you're, you don't want to put that in the favor. And, and, and in some sense, it's like judo, like when they're pushing, you're pulling and you're really just waiting for what move they're making and then you're kind of following suit right to to make that force happen um so i I like that i like that approach of like not putting a fixed timeline on the result because oftentimes you're yeah you're you're not you're going to force something and when you when you insist on something you generally don't get it that's kind of the the rule of life right Um, that's right sean (laughs) that's right that's right you hit it on the head man I, i i wouldn't disagree with anything you said um, so talk to me a little bit about, um, cause I, I know we took a back step of like waiting for that word, the, the two magic words, that's right. And let's say you've magically been able to get there, whether it's the first meeting or the seventh meeting, you know, wh- where do you, where do you kind of take the conversation from there? Cause I think a lot of people understand how to open up and start these negotiations, but most people can't close. I mean, most people have trouble getting the deal. You know, they were so close to getting people excited and then they mess up that last step. And oftentimes, if you don't get that close, like what was the whole point of it? Um, so talk to me about kind of that, that's the second stage of the conversation that happens. And yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And, and, and the reality is that there, there are a lot of options, right? And, and, but that's the thing, if you haven't been shown the tool set, how do you know what all the options are? So I'll throw a few out. Um, the no-oriented questions that we teach at Black Swan have probably become our most famous then closing statements as well. And so uh, simply put, no-oriented question is, is a closed-ended question that is designed to get a no response, specifically designed to get them to say no. And quick example of this is we call people on the phone all the time and we say things like, um, do you have a few minutes? Because we want to say, yes, I do have a few minutes. The flip side of that, that is you call somebody up and you say things like, are you busy or did I catch you in the middle of something? And you're aiming at a no. No, I'm not busy. What's going on? And so same idea when we're closing, we like to say things like, don't you think this will help your organization? Wouldn't you want to move forward with this plan? Would you agree that this is going to help you guys over the next 12 months? Whatever that is, right? We're all, we're trying to get people to say yes. And the flip side of it is, are you against moving forward? Do you think this solution is going to hurt your organization over the next 12 months? Are you looking to completely walk away at this point? Now, those are all questions designed to get a no response. Right. They obviously take a little bit of uh, some guts and some preparation and some and some practice ahead of time. There isn't a single listener on here that I want you to walk into your next $10 million negotiation and say, are you against moving forward with us and having never said that before ever in any other aspect of your life? Right. Get those reps in in the grocery store at home with your family when you're at Starbucks. Right. Get the reps in. get in the cycles so it feels natural when you say it. And you've eliminated a large portion of the anxiety you feel when the words roll off your lips. But that's how we get there. And so sequentially, if you've done proof of life, why would you ever do business with us? Because you guys are great. You understand the marketplace. You've got inventive technology that doesn't exist anywhere else. Then you get into a that's right. So far, you've told me you're worried about all these things in your organization. And you feel like if you don't fix them, it's going to hurt you in the long term. Right? You, that's right. They feel connected to you. And then that last piece, are you against moving forward with our organization solution, right? And the lead up emotionally through that entire series 
is where you get them like, you know what? No, we are not against moving forward. You guys are the right ones. Like we said at the beginning of the conversation, you have inventive technology and you're taking into industry places no one else is. And all of those things line up and create that buy. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny because I would say most people that focus on helping you close the sale will tell you to focus on getting the yes and to have multiple yes throughout the conversation so that getting to yes in terms of the close feels more intuitive or for, feels easier for the other person. But uh, talk to me a little bit about the logic of getting them to say no. Obviously, it's the flip side of like not rejecting, right? So I guess like the, the, the way to get to know is a little easier, but what, why is, what is the, what is kind of the, 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 the research and the science behind this process that eventually gets um, to, to say yes? Sure, sure. Yeah, no, it's interesting, right? And it, it is very counterintuitive, especially what feels natural and what we've heard all our lives, right? So a couple of things. The first problem is, the first, and this is really the, the real problem with trying to get people to say yes, is time and human nature. And what I mean by that is people have been walking other individuals down a yes chain to tie them to a position in an aggressive way for thousands of years. The reality is as human beings, we are extremely sensitive to being walked down this yes path because we've been doing it to each other forever. And so uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, that also means that every, uh, I'm trying, I'm trying to not to cuss here. Every jerk, cuss. right? <laughs> every, every, every piece of shit salesman <laughs> that exists on planet earth uses yes momentum. Mm. Every single one of them tries to get you to walk you into this mere agreement. Yes, yes, yes. Don't you want to make more money? Don't you think the girls are like you in this car, right? They all do it. And if you're over the age of 18, You've already run into one of these snake oil salesmen. And if you haven't been burned by them, you just narrowly escaped being burned. Now that automatically builds up a defensiveness and a propensity to yes, because the last guy that did this to me was trying to scout me. Now, even if you're a genuine person and you take this yes approach with someone, you instantly trigger those subconscious negative emotions around trapping me with the yes. And so you trigger that. And the other thing is we've all, we've all been through it. We don't always know what we're saying yes to, right? Like someone's trying to get me to say yes, but if I say yes, like what all, what all exactly am I agreeing to here, right? That, that question comes up in our mind and again, causes negative emotion, shuts down our thinking process, makes us less cognitively flexible. When we can say no to something, we automatically feel protected. Yes. Instantly means commitment. I'm, I'm tied to it. I have completely given my word. I am now very vulnerable to you. No means I am in control. I'm protecting my autonomy. And I have flexibility in my movement. I'm not tying myself to anything. And that's just the difference emotionally of what saying yes versus saying no, what that does to our, to our feelings, right? Feelings. And so... Um, the other, the other piece is the example I brought up earlier. Call somebody on the phone. Do you have a few minutes? The other aspects to go into that are, well, if I say yes to having a few minutes, how long is a few minutes? And then if I want to talk, do I want to talk to you? And if I do want to talk to you, do I want to talk, to, do I want to talk about what you want to talk about? And then how do I get off the phone? Because I know you said a few minutes, but I can't let you tie me up for 45. All of those subconscious thoughts do not come with having to answer no. You call somebody up and you say, are you busy? No. That's literally the only thought in their brain. So I, I'm not a neuroscientist. You know, may, maybe sometime in a future life, right, I'll go into neuroscience. So I can understand a little bit more of, of the actual neurochemicals and all, and all the processes in the brain. When we can get people to say no, it allows their thought process clarity and space. When we want people to say yes, it makes them defensive and it shuts their thinking down. Yeah, 
No, that, that makes sense. It's um, especially if someone knows the negotiation tactics and if they're informed about sales and just even basic negotiation. And if you know what the other person is trying to do, and some people make it super obvious, which is, uh, you know, do you agree with this? And they really are looking for that yes. You can just immediately sense that, okay, this is a negotiation or, or a sales tactic. And basically, once you are at that point, anything they say afterwards loses credibility. And you just can't take that person seriously because you know it's some form of a script, you know, it's some form of a process that you're going through. And you feel like you're being genuine. reeled in. That's exactly. how it feels. Like you're, like you're the, I'm the, I'm the fish and you're trying to reel me in. And that's how people feel when we take that approach. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I guess some people could argue like any form of approach is that way, but it's, it's more refreshing. I, I would say from the way you're approaching it. Um, now in the, in the, in the perspective of negotiating when there's another expert on the other side, let's say, and this happens quite often, you know, let's say you're negotiating with someone that has more experience. You're negotiating with someone that has more uh, expertise than you in a particular field, but you still want to be taken seriously. You still don't want to be taken advantage of. What are some strategies and tactics you recommend for kind of the beginner or the amateur person that's about to go into a negotiating situation with someone that's a pretty good negotiator, you know, a shark? Yeah, yeah, no, that that's great. Well, <clears throat> the great thing about dealing with a shark or dealing with, you know, we all imagine dealing with that aggressive, assertive, cutthroat, come down the 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 road at you type, like a freight train type of negotiator. And the great thing about dealing with those type of negotiators is they have a lot to talk about. They have a lot that they feel like they're an expert of or to. And getting them to speak is not a difficult thing to do. It's hard to negotiate with someone that either won't talk or doesn't feel comfortable speaking. It's very easy to negotiate with someone that has no problem talking. Now, when we get off track, especially with the cutthroat shark, is while they're talking, their tone of voice is so off-putting that we get triggered because we start to feel belittled. We start to feel like they have more leverage than we do. We start to feel like we can't get a word in edgewise. We start to feel like we've lost the opportunity to, uh, to show or, or show strength in our position. And we do that to ourselves. We're completely triggered by this cutthroat shark. And then we shut down mentally because there's enough negative emotion swimming around in our brain that we have trouble functioning. And when you look at that, and if there's any aspect of that that you agree with, you got to start asking yourself, well, whose fault is it really when I can't perform in that environment? And it's also stress, right? It's a stressful environment that we have very little repetitions in. Exactly to your point, the novice negotiator going against the cutthroat, right? And we just, we haven't dealt with the awkwardness enough to understand how to mitigate it for ourselves when we feel it for the first time. And so some of that is just understanding that mental construct for ourselves. And if we accept that we're going to be faced with it, it becomes easier to deal with in the moment, right? When we go and we go, oh, God, I hope that this person isn't mean, right? And if they are mean, then we're surprised. If we go in and go, you know what? This person's going to be mean and they're going to come at me hard. And when they do, I'm going to sit steadfast in the face of it then we tend to deal with it a lot, a lot better in that moment. So that's, that's one, right? Again, back to the mental preparation. Number two, the importance of letting go of our own justifications is that much higher in those moments because we don't need to create a right fight. If I'm going against this experienced negotiator, they have a lot more cycles explaining why or why not than I do. And so do I really want to create a debate and a contentious interaction with someone that is great at doing it and has done it a lot longer than me? Probably not. So we let go of our justifications that keeps us out of, listen to what I have to say, because I'm right too. 
And then we completely focus on you're here because you're an expert. The reason that they brought you to the table, the reason you're here with the table with me is because your organization trusts you to make a good deal on their behalf. And the last thing that you want to do is jeopardize that in any way. Now, I'd imagine you've thought about this a lot before we get together. Would it be a problem if I allowed you to go first? And now they're doing a bunch of talking and all you got to do is sit back and absorb and then go, it sounds like you're thinking X. Or simply mirror what sounds important or then go, oh, what did you mean by that? Would it be a problem if you went a little bit more detail? Again, no to question. And boom, now they're off giving you more info. And I haven't done very much work. All I did was summarize the position that they thought was probably true and then allowed them to speak. And I've created, you know, right? You create a bunch of space for yourself and you are now reacting to information as opposed to trying to come up with information in the moment. It takes a lot of yeah. pressure off. Got it. So you want them to go first. You want them to share as much information and that way you can have some information. Like you're just collecting information at the end of the day, right? To, to try to gear whatever direction you want to go to. Is that right? Negotiation is not a deal-making process. Negotiation is an information gathering process. And understand that every time you walk into a negotiation, there's information that is being hidden from you. So how do we get to it, right? That should always be the first step. I have incomplete information. How do I get to it? And then that will inform what the end result looks like. I can't decide on the end until I've gotten to that information first. Got it. And what, when you're at that point of really getting to the nitty gritty, right? Let's say you are negotiating price. Let's say you're negotiating salary or equity. Uh, if you're someone in, in, a, in the startup world and you are also in this position of negotiating with an expert, you know, are there avenues that are better suited for specific types of situations? For example, when I was starting to negotiate and I knew the other person had more information, mm -hmm. I would try to avoid live calls. I would try mm -hmm. to avoid, especially in person, obviously the pandemic, all that stuff helped. And I would actually try to direct it towards email Mm -hmm. And that way I had some time because of the medium of asynchronicity uh, to, to research, get information, all that stuff. And I didn't have to share information in real time because as soon as I knew, you know, any body language or any answer that I gave in person, I knew that's where the negotiation was going to go. Um, what, what, is that like a good strategy you find of trying to not just think about what I actually say, but directing certain types of conversations in different mediums, given that we have email now and all of these different channels. Yeah, yeah, a couple, couple of things. So we, uh, excuse me. Sorry about that, I didn't clear my throat. Um, we are huge advocates of live or in-person conversations and then using text, communication as a way to wrap conversations or lead and lead into the next one. So we, we've gotten, we've gotten done with the conversation and then we want to send on a summary email that says, look, we just want to have in writing, right? Anybody, anybody needs to go to court or bring up a problem. We got in writing. Here's the summary that everyone that was involved agreed to after the meeting was over. Um, that's that's probably the 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 biggest way we use email specifically. Here's the summary of where we ended last. Here's the summary that's going to help us lead into our next conversation next week. Um, a lot of our approach with text communication is to keep it short and sweet. And so, a metaphor we often use is treat text communication as if you were playing chess through that text medium. And so if you were playing chess or email, would you send your next eight chess moves in one email? Obviously not. And so it's not that email is a bad medium, it's just that the, being very specific on how we sequence our small pieces of our interaction needs to be calculated. And so it kind of, kind of another piece to that, 
human beings, right? We've been talking a lot about human nature, what humans have a natural propensity for or against. People don't like to read long emails. And so one great way to put our position in a place where we're not getting responses from the other side as quickly as we would like is if every time they open an email from us, it's two pages long. Eventually I get to the point where I don't have time to read this email. I'm a busy person. I'll read this when I have a chance. And then a week, two weeks, a month goes by. They haven't read it yet. And so that, that's, that's just some of that kind of playing that, that role. And so we never want to ask more than one question in an email because we don't want to give them too much to think about. And then uh, uh, another aspect, again, email always has tone. The real problem with that tone is it's dictated by the mood of the reader at the time, mm -hmm. which is completely unpredictable. And That's so another important. reason why we want to keep things short, because if, if it does blow up, if they're really negative at the time, we don't want to give them too much fuel at once. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point about the email is you never know. Uh, I mean, communication is what, like 70%, 80% nonverbal? Exactly. You're just limiting yourself in, in, that, in that tense, especially when it comes down to that you know, critical point of them making the decision. Um, yeah, I like the way you put that there. Is, uh, it depends on the mood of the reader, not necessarily what you feel and what you're trying to, it, it removes the control uh, over what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, and then, and, then, and then just kind of last piece on the email thing. Yeah. We, will, we will use email to try to drive people to the phone. And so kind of, a, kind of like the hybrid of what you're talking about here, right? Use an email to maybe gather some upfront info. Hey, would it be a problem if, I sh if you shared this with me ahead of time? Right, like, hey, I'm sorry to bother you with this. I'm sure you're a very busy person. I'm worried if there's certain aspects of what your organization does or what we're gonna be talking about or whatever, that if I don't understand ahead of time, I won't be able to speak to as well as I should. Would it be a problem if you shared with me X, Y, and Z? And then bang, they share it with you. Here it is, Sean, here's all the stuff. And then you reply back, right? Thank you so much. You've been extremely generous with what you've shown me. Uh, would it be a problem if we set up a 43 minute phone call for Thursday next week, right? And now you got the information piece and then you've used the next email to drive them right to that verbal conversation. So there is, there is kind of the, to your point, this hybrid version of, yeah, we want to gather some information during now, but we don't want to keep it focused there. When we've gotten yeah. some, use it to drive them right to the verbal medium. That's a, that's a really good way to utilize it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, close this off. To close this off, Brandon, what, what are some red flags that if you're on the other side of the negotiation table or just any conversation, really, what, what are some of the red flags that you should look out for? And, and how would you navigate yourself out of that situation? I, I love that question. And so I'll, I'll give you one for sure. And this, and this is simply just we need to know whether or not we're the favorite of the fool in the game. Right. Whoever we're speaking to, there's a really good chance there's other people they're speaking to also. And so are we the favorite amongst the group that they're speaking to or are we actually the fool? Are they just milking us for info and they plan on doing a deal with somebody else? Mm. That's good info to have up front. That's why we uh, we actually harp on this proof of life question so much. The proof of life is simply why would you do business with us or why would you go away from doing business the way you're doing it now? The effort is to get the other side to defend you, right? Because you want to go, Sean, because you're great. You're so smart. You know so much. That's why. If you ask that why question and they don't immediately defend, defend you, that's a red flag. Yeah. Right? If you go, why would you do things differently? Why would you work with our organization as opposed to someone else? And they go, well, you know, we're, uh, we're weighing options here. Um, you know, there's, you, got, you guys are good and we're looking at different things. Right, if they're, if they're waffling, right? The intent of that is to get them to defend you. If they do anything but that, that is a problem. Another yeah. thing they might say is, well, Sean, isn't that why you're here? Isn't, aren't you here to tell us why we should be doing business with your organization? That's a red flag. Mm -hmm. They already got another favorite on the line. Get out of the room quick, right? So that's, that's one of the big ones. You another do you recommend one doing that? Are, sorry to interrupt on it, but do you yeah, recommend yeah. doing that 
before you've gone through the process of the conversation that you know that that you had or do you want do you recommend doing that in the beginning of the call or great or at question the end? great question and we're going to want to do that at the beginning mm, okay and so sequentially right if we're sequencing all of this out we want to open with what we call an accusations audit right here i'm sure you're worried about this i'm sure this is what you were thinking i'd imagine you're here for these reasons and then we follow that accusations audit with I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to do business with you, a lot of options out there in your environment. Why us? Why would you go away from doing things the way you're doing them now? Right. And that's how you set up that proof of life question. We want to do that right at the beginning because we want to reveal that red flag. Right. If they defend mm -hmm. us, that's great. If they don't defend us, that's probably an issue there. We need to know what that is, but it's probably an issue. And then we proceed. But yeah, we want to do that early. The old, the old saying, uh, it's not a sin to not get the deal. It's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal, right? Mm -hmm. That that particular skill is designed to shorten that time frame so we don't waste a bunch of our own. Well, I like that because it's the win-win because you can you can spot the red flags of someone trying to waste your time very early on. But if they do have all of these reasons to work with you, you're kind of getting them to sell your sell you already in their minds just by repeating these things out loud to you and them yep. feeling already. And then now you know where to go in the conversation as well. If they That's are exactly right. Time. You're informed on where do we go from here? Right. Cause they're going to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, cool. Well, Hey, Brandon, I, uh, I really appreciate you sharing so many insights uh, all around, you know, from, from all the way to the beginnings of building that trust to getting that, uh, not on the first meeting, but getting to that, yes, eventually. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Are there any other insights that you recommend people to spend some time practicing? Uh, any other insights that you recommend people make mistakes on? Anything that could really um, leave us as a, as a good takeaway? That's, 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 that's a great question. So really, really two things. Number one, you got to get reps in. I mean, we were talking about this earlier, Sean and I, getting in the practice in low stakes environments is the best way to be prepared when it's really high stakes, right? So practice again, practice at home, practice on the person at Starbucks, practice on getting an upgrade next time you check into a hotel, right? Negotiate the upgrade, negotiate the seat in first class, get the reps in in small stakes, so you build some immunity to the awkwardness. That's number one. And then number two, if we all get in the habit of dropping one line of empathy before we say anything to anybody, that'll help us seamlessly transition any conversation. And so if you got to say something harsh to someone, look at them and say, hey, look, this is going to be harsh. What I'm getting ready to say here in a second is going to sound very harsh. You're going to feel like I'm attacking you and then say it, right? Mm -hmm. Avoid things like, I don't want you to think this is disrespectful, right? Eliminate those words and go right into, this is going to sound disrespectful. You're going to feel, you're probably going to feel like I'm disrespecting you when I say this and then lay it out. We get in trouble when we deny negative feelings and a denial of, I don't want you to think takes away the autonomy for them to feel a certain way. Right. When we flip it into, you are probably going to think this as a result, we set an expectation and we start to diffuse that name. And so that little change in wording makes a huge difference in the long term. Mm. Yeah, slight, slight changes, but um, I, I could see why those would also create a win-win situation because chances are some people may not feel hurt and that's totally okay in the end they'd be like now they've kind of set the worst worst case scenario like oh what is it going to say and likely it's probably not going to hurt their feelings and if exactly. it does they're at least prepared right they've you've at least told them and 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 reassured them this is how they're going to feel so they're not caught off guard mm -hmm. um, slight changes but yeah very powerful stuff Brandon, where can people find you online? Where can people learn more about Black Swan and all of the, the different things? Obviously, the, the book by uh, Never Split the Difference is, is, is one that I highly recommend that I've 
also checked out. Um, where can people learn more about you guys and, and yourself? Yeah, so for those that are, are continuing uh, education, self-learners out there, there's another book called Ego Authority Failure that also comes out of the Black Swan Camp. It's by Derek Gaunt. And it takes everything that we talk about with tactical empathy and never split the difference and applies it specifically to the leadership role. Whether you are a leader, you're thinking about being a leader, or one day you might be a leader, there's going to be something in there that's helpful. So that, that's a great book to read. And then our website, blackswanltd.com. Uh, that's where we drive all of our traffic, any live events that we're doing around the country, any coaching packages or new uh, new classes and virtual sessions that we come out with, all that stuff is up on our website. And you can sign up for our blog there. We have a free blog, comes out every Tuesday morning about 9 a.m. your local time. And it's always based on a very pertinent negotiation topic that's generally sourced from our subscriber list. And so it's less than a thousand words, easy to digest, very applicable. And then we usually have some information on there about, hey, look, this is what's coming at you from the Black Swan Group. So the website, our blog, and then Eagle Authority Failure is a great book to check out. Awesome, guys. Well, we'll link all that stuff below for you guys to check out. Brandon, again, really appreciate your time, man. This has been super helpful. Sean, thanks for having me, man. It's been my pleasure. All right. Guys, thanks for, for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys next week.